I'm Tracy Sable. Tonight on a special one-hour edition of EWTN News Nightly, one year later, on the somber anniversary of the October 7th terror attack on Israel, how world leaders are marking the occasion. We also examine the military response by Israel, the work to bring hostages home, and how Catholics should respond to rising anti-Semitism. Flying high, Pope Francis makes a major announcement about the church's newest cardinals. Plus, it's not a mystery. Thousands of pilgrims flock to an Italian town every year as part of their devotion to the rosary. We'll explain. These stories add more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us on the Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary tonight, a special one-hour edition of EWTN News Nightly as we reflect on the one-year anniversary of the October 7th Hamas terror attack on Israel and the profound impact it has had on the Jewish state, the Middle East, and the world. We begin at the White House, where President Joe Biden marks the tragic and somber first anniversary of the October 7th terror attack. 1,200 people, including dozens of U.S. citizens, were massacred. 250 hostages, Americans among them, were taken into captivity. One year later, the region is engulfed in a brutal conflict with no end in sight. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Good evening, Tracy. That's right. As we speak, exactly one year later, about 100 people, including Americans, remain in Hamas captivity tonight. A third of those hostages are believed to be dead. Efforts to negotiate a ceasefire right now stalled. Israel is at war with Hamas and Hezbollah and is promising to strike back at Iran. And President Biden said today, quote, we will never give up until we bring all of the remaining hostages home safely. In the blue room, President Joe Biden and First Lady Jill Biden joined by Rabbi Aaron Alexander praying for all those who were murdered by Hamas one year ago. For the souls of the Holy Ones, men, women, and children who were killed on October 7th, for this, we pray for the ascent of their souls. May they rest in the Garden of Eden. May you shelter them in the shadow of your wings forever. Moments later, the president, who did not speak, lighting a candle. And after observing a moment of silence, they all left the room. Out of respect, no question shouted, only quiet. Earlier, Vice President Kamala Harris writing, we all must ensure nothing like the horrors of October 7th ever happen again. I will do everything in my power to ensure that the threat Hamas poses is eliminated. Former President Donald Trump also marking the first anniversary of the deadliest attack on Jews since the Holocaust, attending an event in Queens, New York, and later planning to speak before Jewish community leaders in Florida. Today's memorials following a busy weekend of campaigning with Trump back in Butler, Pennsylvania, where he was nearly assassinated in July. A cold-blooded assassin aimed to silence me and to silence the greatest movement, MAGA, in the history of our country, MAGA. Trump also held a rally in Wisconsin on Sunday where he ripped Vice President Harris. And she's worse than Biden, in my opinion. The vice president pushes back against Trump. This is the same guy who said that women should be punished for having abortions? On the other hand, Students for Life blasts Harris and her political party warning, quote, Democrats and abortion supporters have been pushing radical abortion measures as ballot initiatives which would allow for abortion through all nine months. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. A law enforcement in the U.S. remains on high alert over the October 7th anniversary. A number of rallies and vigils are marking the Hamas attack on Israel and the ensuing war in Gaza. But here in the nation's capital, the Christian group Philos Project organized a Standing with Israel rally at the National Mall. And that is where we find Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales with the latest. Eric. Good evening, Tracy. Today's event was somber, but definitely showed its support for Israel. The crowd, much smaller than anticipated, just a few hundred. They heard from a variety of speakers, including the Republican vice presidential candidate, J.D. Vance. Those who did attend tell me that what happened a year ago today should never be forgotten. 
The intent was to destroy the Jewish people. And when we hear about, well, we want a two-state solution, quite frankly, there can't be a two-state solution when one of those uh, parties wants to destroy the other. I think America is in a really dark time right now. And so by supporting this, I feel like, you know, it, it shows that, you know, we're ready to come out of that darkness. Penny Nance, president and CEO of Concerned Women for America, tells me not enough is being done by the Biden administration to get hostages out. I can't imagine a world in which the U.S. president would not be furious and not be demanding they be brought home and maybe perhaps even sending someone in to get them. Kevin Roberts, a Catholic and president of the Heritage Foundation, also spoke at the rally. He says one of his main goals is fighting anti-Semitism. What starts with Jewish people isn't necessarily going to end with Jewish people, and often we Roman Catholics are next. It would be important enough, even if it did stop with the Jewish people, for us to stand up, but we also have to stand up for all people of common sense, all people of all faiths. Others agree. If you look at anti-Semitism historically, uh, it is a deeply troubling uh, phenomenon, and um, yeah, to reiterate, what begins with the Jews never ends with the Jews. Republican vice presidential candidate Senator J.D. Vance defended Israel and condemned anti-Semitic protests on college campuses. Americans believe that, the, that, that Israel, we believe that the Jewish state has a right to exist. We've seen university leaders defending the destructive protests and struggling to condemn blatant acts of anti-Semitism. Of course, you have the right to protest, even if we disagree with your message. You do not have the right to harass your fellow students. Several members of Congress did put out statements on this anniversary. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer wrote that this day will live in infamy, and he compared the attack to the Holocaust. Republican House Majority Leader Steve Scalise says that the U.S. must continue support for our friend in the region, adding, quote, threats to Israel's national security are threats to America's national security. Reporting from Washington, D.C.'s National Mall, Eric Rosales, EWTN News Nightly. Well, in other news, the Supreme Court says a measure in Texas banning emergency abortions that violate the law can remain in place. The White House asked the Supreme Court to throw it out, saying federal law allows for emergency abortions. And now to Florida, where evacuation orders are in place as a Category 5 hurricane is over the Gulf of Mexico and heading at breakneck speed toward Florida's Gulf Coast. It is expected to make landfall on Wednesday and weaken as it hits the land with a record storm surge of over 10 feet. Forecasters say Tampa may get the worst of Milton's storm surge. The evacuations are expected to be the state's largest since 2017. A Pope Francis announces the creation of 21 new cardinals. Terro un consistorio per la nomina Di nuovi cardinali. During a Sunday address at the Vatican, the Holy Father says the consistory will take place on December 8th. The newest cardinals are from all over the world, including Tehran, Tokyo, and Toronto. Four others are from Italy. However, none are from the United States. The College of Cardinals e is now set to have 200 and 56 members. As we mentioned earlier, today is the Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary, and every year, tens of thousands of pilgrims travel to the Italian city of Pompeii, where a special shrine honors the Blessed Virgin. EW10 Vatican journalist Magdalena Valinsky-Ridi has more. It is one of Italy's most important pilgrimage sites, the Pontifical Shrine of the Blessed Virgin of the Rosary in Pompeii, it is an important symbol of Marian devotion. More than three million pilgrims a year come here to seek spiritual solace, healing and inspiration by praying the rosary. It is a prayer rooted in the gospel, in the word of God. It is entirely composed of God's work, the Our Father, the Hail Mary, which includes part of the angel's announcement and the words of Elizabeth. Then there is the doxology, the glory be. Every ten Hail Marys, we contemplate a different passage from the gospel. Situated at the foot of the volcano Vesuvius, the sanctuary of Pompeii was founded by Bartolo Longo at the end of the 19th century. While studying at the University of Naples, Longo was ensnared by the occult and even became a satanic priest. But a friend intervened, convincing Longo to pursue a different path. 
A Dominican priest helped him discover the Virgin Mary and the Rosary. With the help of Countess Mariana de Fusco, he established a society devoted to the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Rosary and started restoring the Shrine of Our Lady of Pompeii. Pompeii is also a place of profound spiritual conversion. So who has passed through here? We've had many saintly pilgrims visit Pompeii. Just think of St. Francis Xavier Cabrini, the patron saint of migrants who came here, as well as St. Maximilian Kolbe and Blessed Carlo Acutis, soon to be canonized. Many popes have visited the shrines in the last decades. In 2008, Benedict XVI brought the Virgin Mary a golden rose, and in 2015, Pope Francis gave her a beautiful golden rosary. In their footsteps, millions of faithful travel to Pompeii to pray at the feet of Our Lady of the Rosary and for the canonization of Bartolo Longo, who was declared blessed in 1980 by Pope St. John Paul II. This is the hope we all share. The canonization, of course, means that any saint is presented as a model for the universal church. Now, Bartolo Longo is known worldwide. As there are many churches dedicated to Our Lady of Pompeii across the Americas, Asia, Europe, and even Africa and the Middle East. And indirectly, these churches also honor Bartolo Longo. Pilgrims and faithful are encouraged to pray the supplication to Our Lady of Pompeii, a powerful prayer written by Bartolo Longo and recited by millions around the world, said to invoke Mary's intercession in a unique way. In Rome, Magdalena Volinskariedi, EWTN News Nightly. And we have a lot more still to come here on this special one-hour edition of EWTN News Nightly, including military response analysis of the Israel Defense Forces, efforts to eliminate leaders of Hamas, and faith leaders react to the terror attack on Israel and the situation today in the Middle East. For staying with us for the rest of tonight's show, we're going to focus on what happened one year ago today in Israel. The current war in the Middle East exploded when the terrorist group Hamas launched a deadly and horrific surprise assault on Israeli civilians. More than a thousand Israelis, Americans and others died in the initial raid, with Hamas also taking close to 250 hostages. It will go down as one of the worst terrorist attacks in the history. In a counterattack, reports say more than 40,000 Palestinians Palestinians have died, and dozens of hostages still remain in captivity. White House correspondent Owen Jensen provides a timeline of the conflict. Hamas led the terror attack against Israel on October 7, 2023. Fighters not only killed Israeli troops, but also hundreds of civilians, including women and children. <laughs> An Israeli music festival and communities near the border with Gaza became the scenes of mass murder. The Israeli Defense Forces quickly struck back, bombing Hamas targets in Gaza, seeking to cripple the terror group's ability to wage war and free the hundreds of people Hamas took hostage. Pope Francis and other world leaders immediately called for an end to the violence, but so far their appeals have not stopped the ongoing conflict. And with many Americans among the victims, President Joe Biden made the U.S. position clear. In this moment of tragedy, I want to say to them and to the world and to terrorists everywhere that the United States stands with Israel. We will not ever fail to have their back. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin immediately ordered more U.S. troops to the region to further defend Israel and deter a wider war. President Biden also traveled to Israel to express his support firsthand. I want to say to the people of Israel, their courage, their commitment, their bravery is, uh, is stunning. There's only one thing better than having a true friend like you standing with Israel and that is having you standing in Israel. Israel did not limit its strikes to military buildings. Even Palestinian hospitals came under attack, sparking international outcry. And by the end of last October, Israeli troops launched their full-scale ground invasion. Entire city blocks turned to rubble, 
and Palestinians started suffering from food shortages. Civilians died by the thousands. Israel says Hamas uses them as human shields. A brief truce took hold last November, allowing about 100 hostages to be freed from Hamas captivity in exchange for the release of some Palestinian prisoners. Later, Israeli troops reportedly freed eight more hostages by force. Innocent people were tragically killed in this operation. The exact number we don't know, but innocent people were killed, and that is heartbreaking, that is tragic. Still, to this day, about 100 hostages remain in captivity. We are determined to bring them home. By last December, with the ceasefire over, the war resumed. And in May of this year, it expanded to Rafah, where many Palestinians had gathered to flee earlier fighting. We will complete the elimination of the Hamas battalions, including in Rafah. There is no force in the world that will stop us. Many forces are trying to do this, but it will not help, because this enemy, after what it has done, will not do it again. It will cease to exist. This spring, the Pope made another plea for peace. Pope Francis, he called for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza so the hostages can be freed and the civilians can get aid. He said, quote, enough, please stop. Does the State Department believe that the Pope's urgent plea can help secure a ceasefire in Gaza? So we believe there ought to be an immediate ceasefire in Gaza that brings the hostages out. Uh, that alleviates the suffering of the Palestinian people, and that's what we're advocating for. There is a deal on the table that would deliver all of those things. Hamas just needs to accept it. The U.S., Qatar, and Egypt have been trying for months to broker a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas, but the war continues. Israel's enemies, many backed by Iran, targeted the Jewish state from other directions. Iran fired missiles at Israel. We don't want a war with Iran. We don't seek to widen and broaden this conflict. We don't want to see things escalate. The Red Sea in Yemen also became a hotbed of attacks. And Hezbollah terrorists in Lebanon repeatedly launched bombs into northern Israel. Whether it's uh, in the north with Lebanon and Hezbollah, whether it's uh, the Red Sea with the Houthis, whether it's uh, Iran, uh, Syria, Iraq. Uh, you name it. The situation with Lebanon boiled over in recent months when Israel targeted Hezbollah leaders and more rockets rained down on Israel, including a second wave of nearly 200 missiles launched by Iran last week, which Israeli and U.S. defense systems fought to repel. Oh, God. Okay, guys, we got to get off the roof. These are coming down right next to us here. The Biden-Harris administration continues to call for a ceasefire even though prospects seem low. The president and I have been aligned and consistent from the very beginning. Israel has a right to defend itself. Far too many Palestinian civilians, innocent civilians have been killed. We need to get more aid in. We need to get the hostages out. Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Uh, some are calling this a war of attrition, and one of the driving factors is Israel's continued search for leaders of Hamas. In response to the massive Hamas terrorist attack of October 7th, Israel initiated Operation Swords of Iron, a sustained air, sea and land campaign to destroy the group's military capacity in Gaza. As the year progressed, Israel launched counterterrorism operations in the West Bank and more recently in Lebanon. Here is a look at how the military campaign unfolded. Israel formally declared war on Hamas on October 8th pounding Gaza with airstrikes. By October 13th, Israel Defense Forces began ramping up its retaliation campaign. Israel ordered more than one million Palestinians in northern Gaza to evacuate their homes immediately. By this point, the Hamas-run Palestinian Health Ministry reported more than 2,000 people had been killed in a week. On October 28th, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced the next phase of the war, expanding its ground operation into Gaza. This is the second stage of a war whose goals are clear. Destroy the military and governing capabilities of Hamas and bring the hostages home. The offensive started in the north focusing on Hamas-built underground tunnels. By the next month, a brokered truce took effect on November 24th, allowing for the release of hostages and aid into Gaza. 
On December 3rd, a few days after the week-long ceasefire expired, the IDF announced it was expanding its ground operations to all of Gaza. Moving south, forces stormed into Khan Yunus, the second largest city in Gaza. Millions of Palestinians were displaced, seeking shelter in refugee camps, which reported a lack of aid resources. By the end of the year, the scale of destruction in Gaza underscored the intensity of the fighting. More than a third of the buildings had been damaged. That's according to Sunni and Oregon State University researchers. The Hamas-run health ministry reported nearly 22,000 people had been killed since October 7th. On May 6, Israel began a new offensive, this time on Rafah, the southernmost city in Gaza. The IDF intensified its airstrikes on the enclave, entering the edges of the city and seizing the last open border crossing. This intensified the devastating humanitarian crisis. Nowhere is safe. Everywhere is a potential killing zone. The U.N. Secretary General again called for a ceasefire. It only took a few months for Israel to shift its focus from Gaza to the West Bank, initiating a ground invasion on August 28th. Continued airstrikes targeted Hamas militants, killing 16. The Palestinian Health Ministry reported more than 650 dead in the West Bank since the start of the war, proving to be the deadliest time period in the West Bank in the last 15 years. Finally, in Lebanon, tensions have escalated with battles between Hezbollah and Israel. Airstrikes on Beirut and a ground invasion into the south. After a series of pager explosions and airstrikes targeting top officials of the militant group Hezbollah, more than 10 top commanders were left dead, including longtime Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah. And still, a year later, tensions are increasing, with the most recent attack coming from Iran, launching more than 100 missiles at Israel on October 1st. Not, they're falling. Raising concerns among the international community of a wider regional war. And joining us now for analysis is Brent Sadler, Navy veteran and senior research fellow at the Heritage Foundation's Naval Warfare and Advanced Technology Cent Allison Center for National Security. Brent, great to be with you today. Uh, one year on, and there are still questions being asked uh, within Israel about the deadliest day in its history and how Hamas was able to carry out this horrific attack in the first place. Brent, so how did Israel's intelligence agencies and military, how did they miss this attack? And who do you think is to blame uh, for this massive? of security failure. Well, well, thanks for having me on today. I mean, this is a dark anniversary. Uh, thankfully, it appears that this war, and it really is a war, and it's already escalated to a regional one, which includes Iran and its proxies throughout, uh, continues. But the initiative appears to be shifting to Israel. But of course, if you went back to October 6, things along the border with Gaza seem to be fairly peaceful. And I think, and this goes to the military operational planning of Hamas, they seem to have lulled Israeli defense forces and even the political leadership that an attack was not imminent nor being planned because Hamas had benefited from that relatively peaceful border for several years. But in reality, we all know now, they had been taking their time to plan a very barbaric attack. Had they stuck to a military objective, it might have been something of a success, but it degraded rapidly into a bloodlust, which then has embroiled other proxies of Iran, like Hezbollah and the Houthis, to take up arms against Israel in the ensuing day. Yeah, and I'm sure many lessons were learned from that day. Uh, the Israeli government initially stated that its aims were to degrade the military capabilities of Hamas and associated terrorist groups, mm -hmm. um, secure the release of Israeli hostages and remove the militant Islamist movement from power. Your assessment, um, how successful has Israel been in achieving those goals? Well, those goals are long term, so it's going to be a while before we see, you know, success. But clearly, Israel has taken the first step, and that is to secure militarily Gaza. The second step is to eradicate Hamas so that it cannot reconstitute itself and come back in some new form in a year, two years later, and repeat.
the atrocities of October 7th. But the longer goal has to be how to sever Iran's support to these proxies that continue to plan and to build and to attack Israel whenever the opportunity avails or at the behest of Iran. So the problem is much bigger than Hamas. Yeah, and a year later, not only is Israel still fighting Hamas, but it's also fighting battles on multiple fronts now. Brent, can Israel continue to keep this up, and where do you see this all going? Well, the momentum is shifting to Israel's favor, and I think the last few months, it certainly hasn't been very helpful that policy recommendations and a pressure that's been applied by Washington has not been leading to a successful or sustainable ceasefire peace. And so Israel has had to go in many ways on its own. That's not to say the U.S. isn't defending Israel from attacks on Iran, which it did just recently in a mass ballistic missile attack. But quite frankly, Israel has the wherewithal to continue its fight in Gaza. It has the wherewithal to continue its fight against Hezbollah. The danger with Hezbollah is the over 200,000 rockets that it has. If it does not take that out, that capability, its Iron Dome, its Arrow, its David think all of these defense systems could be overwhelmed. And so Israel has an opportunity to put to rest a existential threat to its border to the north. And I think that is probably the more testing and trying challenge for the IDF to accomplish. And Brent, thank you so much for your insights. Always appreciate it. Thank you. All right, just ahead, the Catholic Church's response to the October 7th attacks. I'm following apprehensively and sorrowfully what is happening in Israel, where the violence has exploded even more ferociously, causing hundreds of deaths and casualties. Pope Francis's first remarks following the October 7th attacks calling for peace in Israel and Palestine. Speaking one year later, the Holy Father adds, quote, There is one thing that I wish to say to you from the bottom of my heart, dear brothers and sisters, but also to the men and women of every confession and religion who in the Middle East are suffering from the insanity of war. I am close to you. I am with you. Our many church leaders joined in the Holy Father's calls for peace, prayer, and action to help victims on both sides of the conflict. EWTN's Catherine Hadro gives us a look at the Catholic response to the attacks. I express my closeness to the families and victims. I am praying for them and for all who are living hours of terror and anguish. Just one day after the October 7th terror attacks, the Holy Father was quick to respond, condemning the loss of innocent life by armed combatants at a music festival. Since then, he has used almost every public appearance to call for an end to the violence. Terrorism and war do not lead to any resolutions, but only to the death and suffering of so many innocent people. Church leaders across the globe have joined the Holy Father in his plea for peace. From the Archdiocese of Manila to dioceses across the United States issuing statements condemning the violence. Bishop David Malloy, who heads the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops Committee on International Justice and Peace, called on the faithful and all people of goodwill to not grow weary and to continue to pray for peace. Church leaders took to the pulpit and to Twitter in support for the victims, like Archbishop Vigneron of the Archdiocese of Detroit and Cardinal Timothy Dolan of the Archdiocese of New York. My heart goes out to the assaulted people of Israel. New York City has a long history of strong Catholic Jewish relations. And to our Jewish community, we cherish as friends and neighbors back home in New York realizing with tears that their Sabbath yesterday was anything but peaceful. One of the most outspoken advocates for peace has been Cardinal Pierre Baptista Pizzaballa, Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem. I'm with you. Your suffering and pain are my concern. He is particularly focused on the Christian minority in the region, whom he said was caught in the crossfire of the conflict. And I dedicate all my time in prayer, first of all, but also in dialogue with all the responsible in order to put an end to this situation as soon as possible and to support you as much as we can. Pizzaballa made international headlines when he offered himself in exchange for Israeli children taken hostage by Hamas on October 7th. Cardinal Pizzaballa uh, is leading 
the way in in um, most of the region. Uh, and he certainly, you know, has provided support and assistance to people within Gaza, as well as the West Bank. He showed solidarity with Catholics and Christians in Gaza when he visited the parish of the Holy Family, where hundreds of Palestinians have taken refuge since the outbreak of war. Since October one year ago, that little Christian community has been living inside the compound of the Holy Family Parish. Um, today, I just heard there are about 450 Catholics in the or Christians in the Holy Rosary compound, and then there are 200 Orthodox as well. The Catholic response on the ground also came in the form of relief services that answered the dire humanitarian crisis that emerged. CRS has reached uh, over 1.2 um, million people so far. Organizations like Catholic Relief Services, aid to the church in need, Caritas Internationalis, that already serve many in the region, quickly shifted to emergency relief mode for the hundreds of thousands of civilians that were forced to flee. Right away started providing assistance to, to people on the ground. Providing life-saving staples to the thousands of refugees in Gaza and the West Bank. Shelter, bedding, uh, food, sanitation, supplies, uh, as well as water and, and uh, hygiene materials. Many of these aid workers put themselves in harm's way to help. Many of our staff have lost uh, family members and we've had staff injured. People are just showing great courage and, and being heroic. And as the war spread to southern Lebanon. The, the Maronite and Christian community uh, has been suffering a lot from the um, uh, ravages of Hezbollah over Lebanon. So did the aid. At last count, there were about 9,000 Christians in three different villages not far from the Israeli border. And so again, we had food programs, hygiene programs uh, to help those who, who were staying, who'd, who were afraid to leave as well, to give up their, their homes. The Catholic response on the ground will continue throughout the Middle East as long as needed. Let us pray that there will be peace in Israel and Palestine. And so will the prayers of the faithful. Prayer is so important at this time because we can't imagine the fear of, of the people there, the Christians, who have seen so much war already. Catherine Hadro, EWTN News Nightly. A Latin patriarch, Pizzaballa, has consecrated the Holy Land to the Immaculate Heart of Mary. He has also recently asked Catholics, alongside Pope Francis, to offer the anniversary of the war as a day of penance with prayer and fasting. In response to the October 7th attacks, the Coalition of Catholics Against Anti-Semitism condemned hatred against the Jewish people. Andrew Dorn, senior fellow at the Philos Project and one of the coalition's co-founders, says hundreds of Catholics have voiced their support for our br Jewish brothers and sisters. We have almost a thousand Catholic leaders from primarily the United States, but from across the West, who have signed on to the statement uh, from very diverse uh, backgrounds. And we're very pleased to see that so many Catholics are very eager to uh, step up and uh, combat anti-Semitism. Pope St. John Paul II called the Jewish people our elder brothers in the faith of Abraham. And Catholic teaching and tradition has long taught that hatred of anyone is a sin. The Catechism of the Catholic Church notes our own personal link to the Jewish people as they were the first to hear the word of God. And joining us now to discuss that relationship between Christians and the Jewish people is Dr. Stephen Hildebrand, Vice President for Academic Affairs and Professor of Theology at Franciscan University of Steubenville and Frank Rocha, Senior Vatican Analyst for EWTN News. Gentlemen, thank you both so much for being here. We appreciate it. Frank, I want to start with you. Um, as you know, St. Pope John Paul II had placed a significant emphasis on the relationship between Catholics and Jews. Talk to us about why that was so important to him during his nearly 30-year papacy. Well, I think personally speaking, he was, of course, from Poland, where a great part of the Holocaust took place. He had Jewish friends, and so there was a personal element there. Uh, I think it's also, he was uh, one of the 
fathers of the Second Vatican Council, which, of course, uh, produced the document Nostra Etate, which was groundbreaking and uh, exonerated the Jews of any collective uh, responsibility for the death of Christ and repudiated anti-Semitism. Uh, uh, but at the same time, it also uh, broadened that out to uh, other religions to embrace what was true and holy in other religions, which uh, there was a political backstory to that uh, regarding the state of Israel. But uh, for John Paul, I think there was that very important relationship with Jews as what he called our elder brothers in the faith. Pope Benedict uh, preferred to call them our fathers in the faith, but, but the idea is the same. Yeah. Dr. Hildebrand, I'm going to go to you next. Um, um, has the Vatican teaching on the Jewish people, has it changed at all? And how does that extend to the right of Jewish people to a country or a land? Yeah, so I would say no, it hasn't changed. Certainly from Nostra Tate, as, as Frank mentioned, I think there's only been development. And um, I think historically the church has been careful about um, conflating theological uh, teachings and political questions. Um, but certainly uh, our teachings on the right of a people to defend itself uh, and those kinds of things would certainly be uh, in play, certainly uh, as we observe the, the anniversary of October 7th. And Frank, I'm going to go next to you. Um, how does a church approach this complicated relationship uh, between Israelis and Palestinians? And what do we know about support for a two-state solution? Well, the Vatican has always has always supported that. It protested, for example, when uh, uh, the United States moved its embassy to Jerusalem as recognizing Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, because the, the Vatican believes that it, that should be an international city. And 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 the Pope, in this case, is and this falls in a long tradition of trying to be uh, balanced on this. He's he's had to walk a very fine line. Uh, you know, he's condemned obviously the terrorism of October seventh and called repeatedly for the release of the hostages, but he's also been pretty critical, very critical of Israel's uh, uh, actions in Gaza, and he at one point even called it terrorism, which certainly raised hackles in Israel. And so there's this constant need to balance, and it's very, very delicate. He also has to tried to do that in Ukraine, and that, there's a whole other set of complications there. But it, that, that's the constant challenge for, for the pope and for his representatives. Yeah, and what we see happening in the Middle East right now has really had a spillover effect. Uh, we've seen it in college campuses over the past year, all the protests, the, the pro-Hamas, uh, pro-Palestinian protests. Dr. Hildebrand, I want to go to you uh, with this. What is behind all of this and all this anti-Semitism on college campuses? What do you make of it? Yeah, the great question, Tracy. I think everyone was surprised by what happened. Um, there are very few of us who weren't surprised um, one of the most surprising things is uh, most universities, unlike Franciscan, most universities are a, what I would call classically liberal. Even some Catholic universities would see themselves more as classically liberal, which means you have a, a kind of separation from religious authority. Uh, unlike us, we're very confessional and uh, openly so. But these universities that confess uh, in openness, uh, they confess a kind of separation of religion and a kind of marketplace of ideas. It's very striking and surprising to many of us that at these places in particular, they were so hostile uh, to, to one side in this debate um, and, um, and, and seemed uh, so often to, to adopt uh, anti-Semitic uh, ideas and, and sentiments. Yeah, and I know that uh, Franciscan had an answer to that, uh, welcoming students, Jewish students from other college campuses to Franciscan as uh, transfer students. Tell us a little bit more about that and why you decided to do that. Yeah, we see, as I said, we're, we're a confessional school. And so we take from Nostra Aetate our belief that Jesus is the one savior, uh, that, that uh, in him the whole human race is called to, to salvation. But in that very same document, we teach also, and from that same teaching, um, a respect of other people, a respect for human dignity, that God is the father of all uh, in certain respects for sure. So we, we distinguish two kinds of uh, sonship, if you want. There's a sonship that we all have in virtue of being human beings, and then there's a sonship that we have in Christ. And that former sonship calls us uh, to, to respect um, our brothers, uh, our brothers, and in particular with the Jews, we have a special bond. Uh, uh, Frank mentioned Nostra Aetate, and you see this there. The, the, our relationship with the Jewish people gets the longest attention in that document. 
And the reason, of course, is that uh, we owe them a great debt of gratitude. We accept their scriptures as our own, uh, which is a unique relationship. So we have a, a unique relationship with the Jewish people, and we felt uh, a bond of charity, an obligation uh, to reach out and to make them know that they're welcome. Well, gentlemen, thank you both so much for coming on today. We really appreciate it. God bless you both. Thank you. Coming up, how U.S. lawmakers are fighting anti-Semitism. Now, the conflict in the Middle East even spilled onto college campuses here in the United States. EWTN's Mark Irons has more on some of the heated protests. He was walking away. With the threat of being suspended from college or even arrested, students around the country dug their stakes into the ground, camped out on university property, and protested around the clock. Opposing the ongoing Israel-Hamas war in Gaza, many of the pro-Palestinian student protesters demanded their universities cut financial ties with Israel or companies that are advancing the Israeli military effort. So our demands are immediate divestment from corporations complicit in the ongoing genocide in Gaza, a protection of pro-Palestinian speech on campus, and dropping any charges against pro-Palestinian student organizers. On many college campuses across America, protests popped up, including at the University of Texas at Austin, California Berkeley, Ohio State, Arizona State, and the University of Georgia. Many of them began after the arrest of pro-Palestinian demonstrators in mid-April at Columbia University in New York. Police arrested more than 2,000 protesters nationwide. At Columbia University in May, violence escalated when demonstrators broke into and began occupying an administration building on campus before police were sent back in to clear the building and make even more arrests. Around the country, college officials implored student protesters to clear out with rising levels of urgency and some universities moved to shut down encampments after reports of anti-Semitic activity among the demonstrators. Even members of Congress weighed in, including Speaker of the House Mike Johnson. The cherished traditions of this university are being overtaken right now by radical and extreme ideologies. They place a target on the backs of Jewish students in the United States and here on this campus. In that visit to Columbia, Johnson demanded an end to any anti-Semitic behavior met with Jewish students on campus and called for the resignation of the university president. In August, President Manu Shafiq became the third college president to lose her job after testifying before Congress about anti-Semitism on campus. Accused of failing to protect Jewish students, she joined former Harvard University President Claudine Gay and University of Pennsylvania President Liz McGill, who resigned over the turmoil. EWTN News In-Depth's Catherine Hadro visited Columbia University and spoke to students, including Catholic student Teresa Angelo, who said it's false to assume pro-Palestinian student protesters are anti-Jewish. I would invite people to see like more than only this narrative of it is one group against another. Student Jerry Hader said the initial student protest in mid-April escalated when the university first called police onto campus. He says that attracted even more demonstrators who were not Columbia University students. That led to escalations in rhetoric, that led to anti-Semitic chants, that led to um, a lot of Jewish and Israeli students feeling deeply uncomfortable. Nick Baum, a Jewish student at Columbia University, said police and security were needed. Especially outside the gates, gates of campus, because it was especially outside the gates of campus where non-Columbia affiliated protesters had amassed and shouted some horrible things. Yehudim, go away, go back to Poland, we'll repeat October 7th 10,000 times. Those chants endanger my safety as a Jew, and we need security to be there to make sure that those active threats don't spill over into actual physical violence. One Catholic school in Ohio decided to open its doors, offering an expedited transfer process for Jewish students seeking a safe haven. Father Dave Pavanka, president of the Franciscan University of Steubenville, explained he was motivated by the desire to protect his students. Mark Irons, EWTN News Nightly. On Capitol Hill, lawmakers have taken a stand against anti-Semitic actions and protests. Nearly a half a dozen bills passed by the Republican-led House aim to keep Jewish students safe. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales tells us what Congress is doing. 
Good evening, Tracy. Some of the measures considered by Congress are simply to show support for Israel, while others provide millions of dollars in military aid. One bill, known as the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, aims to force the Department of Education to review and investigate complaints of discrimination against Jewish students. Obviously, many of those marching here in the U.S. do not have any evil intent. But when Jewish people hear chants like from the river to the sea, a founding slogan of Hamas, a terrorist group that is not shy about their goal to eradicate the Jewish people in Israel and around the globe, we are alarmed. The bill authored by Congressman Mike Lawler passed the House this spring by a wide margin. This bill has broad bipartisan support and will begin the process of cracking down on the anti-Semitism that we've seen run rampant on college campuses all across America. This is a big day and a big win. Congresswoman Sarah Jacobs, who is Jewish, voted against the bill. And I think it's important that we do things that will actually address the real rise of anti-Semitism and keep Jewish students safe. And that's not this bill that would actually end up sweeping in so many of the nonviolent protesters on campus uh, and would penalize and, and uh, hurt free speech on campus uh, and everywhere else. A vote hasn't been scheduled in the Senate, but they are expected to bring up the bill when members return in November. Republicans say protecting Jewish students shouldn't be an issue. What's going on in colleges today, there's an organized effort to intimidate, harass, and physically assault Jewish students. What's going on today is an effort on multiple fronts to wipe Israel off the map. The fact that this kind of behavior has become widespread on some of these college campuses should be prompting some serious soul searching as to how we have let things get to this point. And an immediate reckoning for students engaged in harassment, assault, or other unlawful behavior. Free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine. Lawmakers are also eyeing colleges and universities that receive federal dollars through government grants who have not been held accountable for allowing anti Semitic activity. What I am saying is common sense. You're a visitor. You're not even an American. You're a foreign national. You're here because we gave you a visa to be here temporarily, and now you're out there defending and supporting Hamas, a terrorist organization. You need to go. Why should a university that, is, that spews hatred and anti-Semitism get any of our federal dollars? If you're, if you're faculty or if you're in leadership at a university and you don't, you're not willing to stand up, quit. Let's get somebody that cares about Jews, cares about all the students, make sure they're safe. If you're a student, and you're at one of these universities, and you spew hatred and anti-Semitic, you need to be expelled. The two Florida Republicans have teamed up to sponsor a bill designed to hold colleges and universities accountable. The measure called the Preventing Anti-Semitic Harassment on Campus Act expands civil rights laws to prohibit discrimination based on religion, establishes clear escalating penalties for institutions that are repeat offenders of anti-Semitic discrimination, mandates that laws be enforced as rigorous as anti-Semitism as it is for other forms of discrimination. We have to stamp out anti anti-Semitism right now. If you think about what happened in the 1920s and 30s, you cannot wait. You cannot wait for this to metastasize into something even more evil than what we're seeing today. Bottom line, while Congress has done something to crack down on anti-Semitism, lawmakers admit more needs to be done. The new Congress, which convenes in January, plans to accomplish this goal. At the Capitol, Eric Rosales, EWTN, News Nightly. It has been a year since we first saw their faces, those kidnapped by Hamas terrorists on October 7th. As of right now, 101 hostages still remain in captivity. Since their capture, family members have repeatedly asked Israeli leaders to do more. Others have made the trek to Washington, D.C., asking U.S. lawmakers to intervene. One woman who was released by Hamas told her story of living in fear one second at a time. All the hostages there are in such bad conditions. I was there. I had infection in my stomach. I was sick. I was scared. I was crying. I was begging. I was taken underneath the ground, and I was sure in a couple of hours I'm going to be dead. There was no oxygen there for me to breathe. Aviva Siegel says since her release, her mission now is to bring those left behind home. And I want to ask Bibi, Netanyahu, 
and Biden, if it was one of their relatives or one of their lovers, if they think they're doing enough for us, because we have had enough. And they, the hostages, have had more than enough. I am quite sure that Prime Minister Netanyahu and his government, if they do not act decisively now, do everything that they must to get uh, our hostages home and to end the madness in Gaza, will be remembered as a catastrophe for the state of Israel. Uh, since its inception in 1948. But he actually said, uh, I want to say my last words, we're not going to survive it. Nobody survived it. Everybody is killed. Doris Lieber shared the story of her 26-year-old son, Guy, who was shot in the arm. He was working as a sound tech at the music festival when the attack took place. It wasn't until days later that she learned her son was taken hostage. Every day is like eternity to me, and I can't wait any longer because I know that he was shot. I know, I don't know anything. She and others want the Biden administration to do more and add the actions by Hamas should be a warning to all Americans. This is a call for action, and this is a wake-up call not only for Israel, not only for the Jewish community. This is a wake-up call for all of you, all of you here all of America, all of Europe. Our kids cannot uh, serve as a uh, bargaining chips in the uh, midst of uh, U.S. elections and in the limbo of Israeli politics. They need to be prioritized. Iris Leniato's parents were murdered by Hamas on October 7th. All she wants is their bodies to be returned. It seems like all international pressure is being put on Israel. And I'm asking myself, where's the outrage of the international community about innocent hostages being taken from their beds on October 7th into Gaza? And we are dealing with terrorists right now, terrorists who are not only terrorizing 101 hostages, they are holding my parents as bargaining chips in Gaza. That in itself is sick. Families of those taken say whether you support Hamas or Israel, the only way out of this is to reach a deal, a deal where everyone's loved ones can return home. But the people of Gaza can begin to reconstruct their lives, and we all, including here in the United States, avoid what could be a catastrophic regional and perhaps beyond regional war. And when we return, a look at where the conflict could go from here. Israel has fought a shadow war against Iran and its proxies for decades, but in the last year, the hostilities have erupted on several different fronts. To talk about this, let's bring in Dr. Farhad Razai. He is a Middle East expert at the Philos Project. Good to see you again, Farhad. Um, you know, right after the attacks, uh, some of Iran's proxies jumped right into the conflict. Uh, Alberto Fernandez, uh, a former vice president of the Middle East Media Research Institute, who previously served as a U.S. ambassador and diplomat, noted that in a recent interview. Let's take a listen. Well, of course, Hamas uh, originated the conflict on October 7th, but Hezbollah joined on October 8th. Uh, and since then, uh, 9,000 Hezbollah rockets have uh, have fallen on Israel and wounded and injured uh, people, civilians, including children. Iran, Iran created these proxies, uh, including Hezbollah, as a kind of safety network for Iran's ambitions in the region. Fred, I want to get your reaction to that. I know you know so much about that and what's happening in Lebanon. Well, Ambassador is so right. Uh, Hamas and Hezbollah and other proxy groups that, that the Islamic regime controls in the Middle East. By the way, there are 19 terror groups that the regime controls. All of them are fighting the regime's fight against Israel. The time that the, the uh, revolutionaries in Iran came to power, Khomeini's came to power, they decided to take on Israel for a specific reason. They said they want to return Jerusalem to the hand of Muslims, but they did not want to do it directly because of various reasons. The most important one was Israel was a strong, it had a strong army, it had the support of the United States, and they decided to do it through proxies. 
And this, this war against Israel has been continuing for this 45 years by the Islamic regime against Israel through proxies until October 7. On October 7, Hamas carried out that brutal attack against Israel, killed over 1,200 civilians, raped Israeli women, beheaded Israeli children. And day after, uh, Hezbollah in the north started to shell Israel over 9,000 rockets against Israeli civilians uh, and Israeli cities. So this story has continued up to very recently that Iran decided to enter the fight directly. On, in April, it decided to attack Israel with a barrage of ballistic missiles and drones. And then once again, very recently, a few days ago, again, started to attack Israel with ballistic missiles. So what I can see here is that this proxy war between the Islamic regime in Iran and Israel is now changing. The dynamic is changing and the proxy war is changing to the direct war between Iran and Israel. Yeah, and there are so many people caught in the crossfires of this, a lot of innocent people, including Christians. What are the implications for Christians in this region? Look, th th this is a very good question. The implication for Christians is really huge. Iran has a history of persecution of Christians, not only inside Iran, but also in the Middle East. We actually have a report about this, the invisible jihad, that the Islamic regime in Iran and its proxies in Iraq, in Lebanon, in Syria, and in Yemen waged a brutal war against the Christians. If Iran manages to defeat Israel, Christians will suffer a lot. They already are suffering by by the, the war that the Iranian regime and its proxies are waging against Christians. And if they manage to defeat Israel, Christians will suffer a lot. So this is the moral responsibility of the West, especially the United States, to not let that happen. Well, Farhad, thank you so much for coming on. Always appreciate it and the good work that you do. God bless you. And we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, X, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.